Howdy. So we're shifting gears a little bit now and we're going to start talking about defects in materials. Um, and defects are important because every material has them in one form or another. Uh, and in a lot of cases, the properties of materials are dictated more so by the defects than by the underlying perfect crystal structure. So it's important to be able to describe, for example, not only the lattice in uh, a crystal, this is a two-dimensional material, molyb molybdenum disulfide, um, but also to describe what kinds of defects uh, it has. And these are all examples of point defects. So uh, if you think about what we've done so far, we've talked about perfect crystalline materials. We've talked about totally amorphous materials, uh, so materials that lack any long-range order. Uh, we've talked about some things in between uh, that spectrum. So these are examples of liquid crystals. Um, but even within perfect crystals, again, there's no such thing as an absolutely perfect crystal. Um, there's always some sort of flaws in there, and that's what we're going to start talking about. And specifically today, we're going to talk about point defects. Um, so it's worthwhile thinking about how perfect can we get. Uh, and the good example is perfect silicon, because silicon is used throughout the semiconductor industry, and we want to grow our materials on the best uh, you know, substrate, the best underlying material we can get. Um, and so we've, we've gotten, over the years, we've gotten very, very good at growing single crystals of silicon. So this is a boule. Uh, it started out as a very tiny crystal uh, that was placed into a melt, and it spun and slowly pulled out, and the result is this long cylindrical crystal. Uh, and just to give you an idea of scale, these things can be taller uh, than you or I am. Um, so let's think about a cubic centimeter of this silicon and ask how many defects uh, are in that volume. Um, and so the atomic density of silicon has 5 times 10 to the 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. Um, if we think about something that's chemically pure, so you know, if you order a chemical from a chemical supply company, 99.99%, you know, that's 100 parts per million. Um, uh, impurities, that's, that's pretty common. Um, and that would be 5 times 10 to the 18th centimeters cubed. Um, the, the most uh, chemically pure we can get, uh, in this case, it would be called electronic ray. This is something that goes through many different uh, processing steps. It's actually converted um, from a solid into a molecule that is uh, in the vapor phase, and that molecule is uh, purified and then recondensed. Um, it can get down to one part per billion uh, defects. So out of a billion atoms, one of those is not silicon. Um, but that still is an awful lot of atoms in a cubic center centimeter of material. So that's still about 5 times 10 to the 13 atoms. Um, and it gets even worse than that, right? Because that's talking about chemical impurities, something you know not silicon in there. But even if we were able to get chemically pure, then there are things uh, like missing atoms on a lattice. So a vacancy is a, um, a missing atom where we expect there to be a silicon atom. Um, and vacancies are temperature dependent. Um, and even at, you know, something on the order of, you know, a little bit above room temperature, um, there's about 5 times 10 to the 7 vacancies per cubic centimeter. So even if we were able to get it totally chemically pure, there's still going to be defects, missing silicon atoms. Um, so even at lower temperatures, some number of defects exist. Those vacancies we talked about, those are examples of intrinsic defects. Um, extrinsic defects are defects from outside of the system, um, and you know generally that's uh, that can be an even more uh, important term because there are quite a few more of those. Um, and so what that means is there are so many defects that we could never explicitly describe the position of every single defect in the system. There are just too many to do that. Um, and in fact, uh, the problem gets even more complicated. Uh, because uh, atoms vibrate thermally, um, and so I'm going to have a bunch of YouTube links up here that uh, I, I um, you know, uh, recommend you follow. They'll be posted in the slides. Um, but picture a system with springs that are all oscillating, um, and so at any finite temperature, um, atoms are bouncing around, um, and defects can potentially move. So this is a little video, if you watch it, you'll see this silver ad atom. It's a silver kind of bouncing around on the surface of the material. So that's the example of a surface defect moving around. But uh, vacancies can form and can reheal over time. So this is a picture, uh, a snapshot of a, of a movie that's showing a ice lattice, so a bunch of water molecules. And again, they're being held at some temperature. And at some point, 
um, one of these molecules bounces off its lattice position, so it leaves behind a vacancy, um, but the molecule itself is still in the system, so the vacancy and molecule can move around. Um, and if you give them enough time, they might even find each other again, and they can recombine, uh, and the vacancies could potentially heal. Um, so all of this is to say that, that vacancies and other point defects are not static things. So even if we could describe the location of every single position, locations change, and intrinsic defects tend to appear and disappear over time. So all of these uh, defect positions would have to be time dependent because they're always moving around. Um, so because of that, we tend not to describe every single defect position. Rather, we describe the statistics of the defects in the system. We describe their probability to occur. We describe things like their mobility, how easy it is for them to move around. Uh, and these are important. I can give a couple examples about why. And, and one example is in electronic materials, um, point defects can control the electronic structure, and particularly things near um, the highest level of occupied orbitals, so uh, the valence band uh, or in the conduction band. Um, so this is an example of titanium dioxide um, and different kinds of uh, defects can occupy energetic states in the band gap. And so they could change, um, in fact, they could change a material from a, just a kind of okay insulator to something that's quite conductive. Um, so within the band gap in titanium, there are all sorts of different potential uh, defect states. And these are all examples of intrinsic defects. So these guys are titanium interstitials. So a titanium sitting uh, in a, a, a hole in the lattice where nothing usually sits. Um, these are uh, oxygen vacancies, uh, and these are titanium vacancies. So missing titaniums are missing oxygens from the lattice. And each of those potential defect states has a different energy level associated with it. And so it could interact with the electrons in the system um, and change its electronic properties differently. Uh, another great example would be optical transitions. Um, so. This is the schematic of, of how a, a Ruby laser works. And lasers basically work by uh, absorbing uh, light um, at some high energy state. So um, electrons are excited from one state up to a higher energy level state. Uh, and then they decay down to this metastable state and they all emit coherently. And that, that creates the laser beam over here. Um, but in order to create these higher level uh, defect states, oftentimes we introduce extrinsic defects into the systems. Uh, so chromium ions, that's what gives a red ruby its reddish color, um, are introduced into uh, rubies in order to um, absorb at the right wavelength, the, the right energy state. Um, so again, electronic optical properties, very sensitive to point defects. Other properties like um, like the strength of a material, the yield strength, these can be very sensitive to um, dislocations and to other kind of uh, microscopic defects in the system. Um, so like I said before, even at lower temperatures, um, so room temperatures, some number of defects always exist. We tend to think about them as statistical systems. Um, so we can describe what's called a formation energy. Um, we think, tend to think about what the impact is of these. Um, and in many cases, you know, we can, we can think about all the different defects that could potentially occur in the system, uh, but then really only focus on the lowest energy defects because those tend to be the most abundant. Um, so the way you read this graph, formation energy, the higher up you get, the more energy it takes to, to create that um, defect. Um, the Fermi energy could be related to the, the biasing of the system. Is it charged or is it neutral? Um, and so at different Fermi energies, all these different defects have different probabilities of forming. But over a large range of conditions, uh, nitrogen vacancies are the most important defect. They're the lowest formation energy. So in this case, we could probably focus primarily on the effect that those defects have on the material. So we're going to go on and talk more about definitions of some point defects. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about a notation to write those defects um, in the following videos.